Hello there and many thanks for joining us on this edition of the program. I am Imoni Amarere. In the last couple of weeks, there has been a resurgence of security threats, breaches, attacks and killings in different parts of the country. Of particular note are the attacks and killings in Benue, Plateau, Niger, Kaduna and Zamfara states, amongst many others. Banditry and abductions for ransom are still rife in several places, including in the southeast, where the indigenous peoples of Biafra enforcers have been holding the populace by the jugular. The very latest in the series of security threats is the ambush and killing of 36 military officers by terrorists in Chukuba village in Shiroro local government area of Niger State and the subsequent crash of an evacuation helicopter on a rescue mission. And then the ambush and the firefight resulted in the death of three officers 22 soldiers, while seven were wounded in action. As a result of this, there was need for cast casualty evacuation, whereby the Air Force helicopter was dispatched. While that process was on, that operation was on, and inbound to Abuja, the helicopter crashed. And it crashed with 14 of the previously killed in action personnel at the ambush, seven of the previous wounded in action personnel at the ambush, the two pilots for the helicopter, and two crew members. Now, Amnesty International estimates that more than 123 people have been killed by violent extremists, bandits, and abductors <coughs> since the president's inauguration on May 29. The defense headquarters has confirmed that military operations in the last two weeks alone have killed 28 terrorists, arrested 106 criminals, and rescued 82 abducted civilians, an indication that insecurity is still pervasive. Accordingly, troops will continue to respond with overwhelming military force against any group that threatens the safety of citizens and troops alike. The men and women of the military will continue to put themselves in arms way time and time again in order to protect our great nation. During the week leading to the 17th of August, which is today, the military in the course of its operations, neutralized 28 terrorists while 92 of them were arrested. Six gun runners, three kidnappers, six collaborators, and seven perpetrators of oil theft. Troops also rescued 82 kidnapped hostages and denied oil thieves the estimated value of over 870 million naira. In yet another development, Nigeria's secret police, the Department of State Services, has also recently warned of another possible attack on the Abuja-Kaduna rail line by terrorists. 
all of these worrisome developments may have prompted the meeting between state governors and the national security advisor this week to presumably set a new security agenda in addressing the peculiar challenges in different parts of the country. This is even as the president has named former Jiga state governor Muhammad Badaru as his defense minister and former governor of Zamfara state Belo Matawale as minister of state defense. He also designated Seidu Akali as interior minister while Ibrahim Gaydam, former governor of Yobe state, will take charge of the police affairs ministry. These three ministries are without doubt very critical to the security of Nigeria and the safety of its citizens. Nigerians have for years lived under the cloud of fear from one form of violent threat or attack on or the other. And the expectation and hope is that the Tinubu government will bring them the much needed succor. This much was promised during the election hearing campaigns. And so on the program today, we shall examine the unabating insecurity in the country and uh, look at new strategies that could be brought to bear in addressing the situation. Is the president putting round pegs in round holes as far as the security sector is concerned? Big question and many more questions that we'll be attempting to find answers to on the program today. Join us. When we return from this break, we shall be meeting our guest analysts. Online, online. Let's get to meet our guest analysts, uh, three of them. Two of them are right here with me in the studio, and the other is joining us virtually via Zoom, uh, all the way from Yola. We have joining us from Yola, Professor Jude Momodu. is the Director, Center for Peace and Security Studies, Modibo Adama University in Yola. Thank you so much, Professor Momodu, for finding time to join us. Thank you so much, uh, Imonia Mari. All right. Uh, for so inviting me to be part of this uh, conversation. You are most welcome. Well, all, all yes. joining us here in the studio are two uh, experts in their various fields. First, from my left is uh, Mr. Michael Mbanefo, who is a security analyst. He's a lawyer by training, but he's uh, very much vast in security issues. Thank you so much, Mr. Mbanefo. Thank you for very joining much. us. Also joining us is Mr. Van de Fan Tezu James. He is a retired senior police officer. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank James, you, for finding us uh, time to join us. Thank you. All right, so let's begin this way, Professor Momodu. Uh, wh what would be your take on what many have described as an unending and unabating security crisis in Nigeria? Uh, during the electionary campaigns, there appeared to be a lull somewhat, and immediately after, it appears that uh, these terrorists, these bandits, and these criminals uh, have resumed their activities across the country. Yes. Um, um, my quick impression is that um, uh, it, it does appear that uh, the security agencies uh, appears not to be on top of uh, the situation in terms of uh, fighting insecurity. Yes, they are, they are making some effort, but uh, by now, uh, one would have expected that uh, the issues of uh, insecurity, especially banditry, uh, the insurgency did not uh, east as well as uh, the Boko Haram insurgency. By now, uh, one would have expected that uh, they should have been able to, uh, to nip them to the board. Uh, just like you rightly observed, uh, during the election uh, period, uh, we saw that uh, there was a... Uh, complete uh, drop in uh, terms of the activities of uh, uh, non-state armed groups uh, that have been uh, uh, causing problem, trouble uh, here and there. But now, uh, with the uh, change of uh, uh, service, if one would have expected that by now, uh, the issue, the security agency would have been able to, uh, to deal with the issue. Uh, look at what happened in Niger, uh, just uh, last, uh, in Niger, uh, just last week. Uh, we lost about uh, 36 uh, 
uh, military personnel. So that uh, does not show that uh, the security agents are, are able to, uh, to deal with the problem. However, I would also like to say that, uh, that uh, um, kinetic uh, uh, approach to dealing with insecurity may not be sufficient because uh, uh, the key drivers of insecurity in Nigeria today is what uh, uh, unemployment, uh, issues of uh, poverty, and uh, marginalization. So as long as uh, uh, the th th those who are saddled with the responsibility of uh, uh, governing Nigeria, the state gov governors and the, the federal government all do not deal with the issues, the questions of unemployment, inequalities, economic inequalities, then uh, security uh, threats will continue to, uh, to be on the rise. And uh, there's little or nothing that the security agents should be able to do. So the point I make is that, that we need to, uh, to use two approaches. Um, kinetic approach. Uh, then also we also need to uh, to use the approach of what uh, of governance, instrumentality of governance, to be able to address the key uh, drivers of insecurity within the country. So that's my quick uh, um, uh, response uh, to your question. Thank you so much, Mo uh, Professor Mamadou. Let's uh, get uh, a feel of what our guests here in the studio uh, think of what is ongoing, Mr. Ambarenfo. Okay, um, my take here is that um, the relationship between politics and uh, security of a sovereign state is uh, intricate and uh, multifaceted in the sense that um, I listened to what Professor said, but uh, to an extent I bet to disagree because uh, if guns were not outlawed, only outlaws will carry guns. The security service chiefs and the rest of them have just been put in place. It's a new system. And for the people who are causing internal security instability, uh, they have premeditated to carry out those dastardly actions before the time it happened, coincidentally, at the advent of the new service chiefs. If you take, for instance, a situation where you have the national security, the national security policies and, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and so on are implemented by, it, it determines the agenda of a new government. And it is based on the priority that is being given that those security agencies will swing into action. And also it requires a very firm leader who can take decision no matter who causes God, bearing in mind that the civil society can begin to echo Pre, uh, 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 talk about the government killing people arbitrarily without considering the extent of impact that those security lapses are causing for the nation within the, the country. Again, if you look at policies that are put in place in terms of security and the diverse nature of the country, you find out that ethnicity, religion, and cultural diversity play a major role in the determination of how our security apparatus will be put in place. But if we have a patriotic mind of oneness and cohesion, I think that the security agencies will be encouraged and supported to nip the uh, nail on the board mm. when it's required. Now, Mr. James, uh, I, I'd like to draw your attention to the particular situation in Benue and Plateau States. This has been ongoing for years, and it appears that no solution is being found. Almost on a weekly basis, we hear of people being hacked to death in their homes, in their villages, in their farm states, and it, it just it, it begins to look as if it's dis defying any human solution. Well, thank you. And, uh, Issues of insecurity in these two states has been known for years, just as you said. It does not mean it uh, defied all solutions that were supposed to be put in place. It's laxity on the part of those who are supposed to enforce these laws, the security apparatus within the states, because particular operations were put in place in Plateau and Benue for the purpose of containing this insecurity. Now, these things happen inside the villages and the settlements, and we are not uh, saying that the military or the police didn't have enough manpower and uh, firepower to contain most of these things. But as uh, my colleague here said, when tribalism and religious issues comes to play in the lives of both the security men and those who are the key actors inside the villages, you discover that 
you will keep having this skill is going on because it is either this group kills this group and tomorrow there's a repressor attack and it continues that way. But politically, the governors are supposed to also intervene to making sure that these things happen. Now, in Benway, it is a thing that has been purely localized in one particular area, which is from the zone A of the state. And when you look at the key actors in zone A, as soon as Ghana was taken off, they discovered that his group now decided to disperse and form cluster groups. And those cluster groups are the ones that are causing mayhem among themselves. So it has become a thing of group A trying to make sure that it will outweigh you around this place. Now, political will power should be the thing that can, one, reduce most of these things because they are all known to the locals, those who are causing these mayhems. If you ask the Fulani community in uh, Plateau and uh, local bureau and communities in Plateau, they know those who are causing most of these things and the reasons why they are doing it. But there have been no serious government interventions in terms of political approach to ensure that these two factions are brought to the table to discuss and see how they can be able to really understand the dynamics of what is their differences and what is causing most of these things. In Jaws, we could be looking at land acquisitions, we could be looking at the good weather that habitat most of the animals that they rear. But there and then you have the farmers who also want to farm. And when there's a conflict between the two, then anger will flow up and killings will start. So this has been going on for years, and no governor has been able to sit down with security agencies and say how they can provide political solution first before approaching the kinetic aspect. If you want to approach the kinetic aspect of enforcing these uh, solutions that have been drawn out, and you said, okay, no killings, and tomorrow you discover the right killings again, then you know who you can hold. So in Benway, it's an issue that was a, a, a thing between Taraba and Benway because of ethnicity, land uh, agitations, political power. When that thing was almost settled, then there was a fallout of those who now left Taraba into Benway. And when they came into Benway, they formed their closer groups and started fighting themselves. If you go to Joss, it's the same thing you'll be seeing, that the Flanese want land. They also want names to be changed into their own identities. And the people who are the locals want these ancestral lands to also remain. But what efforts have been done by governors or local government chairmen to do this thing remain for us to be known. So the army is supposed to move all out to ensure that they encounter most of these killings. By doing this, you just rapid deployment and ensure that because we know the locations where they are, we know those who are the key actors. Once you arrest someone today, you are supposed to find out who supplied the guns, who stole the guns, who gets the ammunition. And if these sincere approaches are adopted, by now we would have been talking about no more insecurity in the country. But because maybe investigation doesn't get to the real, real areas where they can be able to unearth who are the real promoters of these things, and we allow them to stay. So the will power to arrest those who are behind the killings, those who are supplying the weapons, has not been there at any given point in time since this thing started. Because a local farmer cannot afford to buy a naked for the seven or 400,000, and you are having them in thousands inside the bush there. How do they get to you? You are supposed to find out and cut up this chain of supply, the chain of financial sponsorship, and the motorcycles they use are also supplied them by some person. The food they use, is bought from filling stations in Jerichans, in large numbers of Jerichans. So if we are actually trying to see in Benway, for instance, that we want these things to end, we know those who are the real actors in Benway, so we'll call them. And a sincere approach to dialogue should be employed, and the youth not taking off, just as Prof said, unemployment. Engage them into training, and then give them some stipends for them to start doing something meaningful. If you want something to happen in Plateau, cows are not graze everywhere. Farmers don't farm everywhere. There must be a below-the-point approach where all this peace can be done to ensure that everybody understands the importance of each person because a full animal in the bush also needs uh, food, a farmer in the food also needs food, so you all need yourselves, and the protein they carry, we all need it. So there must be, first of all, that serious political agitations by governors to ensure that they find out the exact root causes of these things and those who are behind it. Call them bring the security men, sit on a round table and agree in a communicate that we have resolved this and from now on, if this happens, it's not going to be agreed again. So until we're able to do this, if not, we will continue to have this round of killings <coughs> in Benway and in Plateau as it is. Mm. Mr. Ambadenfo, beyond the ethnic differences, religious differences, uh, and, and in some cases, um, a combination of both, are there cases of pure criminality that we can easily identify? Yes. Because, for instance, you mentioned 
the, the, the Ghana uh, boys in Benue. Uh, each time they are apprehended and is mentioned in the media, it is that this is a criminal gang. Okay. Um, in addressing that, I would like to say this. There is no way a group of persons will be addressed as criminal if the substantive chief of security does not see them as criminals. The truth of the fact is that we have somehow played into the hands of the devil by not differentiating political promises to political inclusion of criminals in order to succeed whichever way it happens. I give you a case in point. You come to political scenarios where thugs, people who have AK-47, you see people who are not police officers, people who are not military personnel and so on and so forth, brandishing even rifles that are not registered, all in the bid to make sure that their own person succeeds. How do you take back these dogs, these underdogs, back to their cages without food, without any, anywhere to go? The only thing is to wipe them out. But the question is, when you raise up that hand to wipe them out, can you do that? That is what turns them into terrorists and bandits. Now, beyond what uh, my brother here said, if you arrest a group of persons who has committed an offense or who are termed criminals, without addressing the issues that brought about their criminality, and also being able to identify who are criminal and who are defendants against criminal, criminal attacks. It, 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 the security uh, agencies will not know who and who, who and who to attack. And being that the political figures, for example, the people that the government in power, if they don't take a firm stand and say it doesn't matter which side, because for example, if you attack me today with a gun and I am wounded, maybe at the point the security agencies will come, I will be the one found with knife trying to retaliate. It still makes me a criminal. I am not bound to take my laws into my hands. So it is for the government of every state, local government chairman of every local government, uh, paramount rulers of every, every uh, sub-cultural uh, 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 leadership to stand up and say what the truth is. I always tell people in the program, I said, you can't use another man's dog to go for hunting. When the owner of the dog comes, he calls his dog by his name and it will go back. So for us to address the issues with regards to uh, uh, the security challenges that are internal within the country, we should forget about diplomacy and call a spade a spade when it's time for, for, to do so. The military cannot unilaterally without a command go and begin to shoot people, even when they know they are criminals, even when they are being killed, until their commander is a man who is firm, who is very patriotic, who loves Nigeria selflessly, comes into play. You don't expect me to arrest my younger brother, same mother, same father, because he had a gun, he is doing something, I should go and kill him. But if I am selfless, I will set an example with him. Unless we begin to be selfless in this country, we can't head anywhere. Mm. Professor Momodu, let's come to you. You live in the northeast of Nigeria. Uh, let us into some of the new trends and new threats to security in that part of the country uh, uh, at the moment, at least in the last uh, two months to two and a half months. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, the north is like uh, the headquarters of insecurity in Nigeria today. Um, uh, since 2009, uh, the Boko Haram agency has been raging, and uh, up to now, it's still there um, in the north uh, east of Nigeria, particularly in the Bay State, uh, Borno, Adama, and uh, Yuk Bay State. Uh, although we have seen a significant improvement uh, in terms of uh, countering the extremism of Boko Haram, and uh, the, the parts of the north also, including Adama State, uh, the Farmada crisis also have also been a major secret, although it does appear that, or that uh, it's uh, also uh, scaling down now. Then in the north uh, west of uh, Nigeria, uh, where uh, banditry is uh, very rife there, um, most of the states in the northwest have been um, are facing the challenges of uh, uh, bandit, banditry now. And uh, 
the, the, the bandits are now getting sophisticated by the day to the extent that uh, twice now I've seen them uh, bringing down uh, military aircraft. Uh, in, in, in the first one was in uh, Kaduna, then uh, the recent one in Niger also. So, um, so, so these are serious uh, security threat uh, that uh, uh, the government is trying to 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 to, to, to address. So, as I said, the notice uh, and a lot of people have have been killed. A lot of communities have been sacked. A uh, lot of the IDP profile is now uh, very high in, in in the north. So, these are the critical uh, security threats uh, that uh, uh, is uh, that are. Uh, common in the, in the north, uh, northern part of, of, of the country. Uh, but, but again, uh, l let me be say this now, that the rate of insecurity we are seeing today and uh, the character of insecurity we are seeing today are just symptomatic of, of the failure of governance. Failure of governance at the central level, failure of governance at the state and uh, at the local government level also. So once the question of, of governance is, uh, is fixed, uh, these symptoms we are seeing uh, in the form of insecurity will just will just fizzle out. Uh, and again, um, most of these security that we are seeing, whether in the north or the southeast or in any part of Nigeria, uh, again they are they are local. They are local. So uh, that um, one way of dealing with this local security threat is what people have been uh, agitating for. Can we have state police? Can we have state police? The police we have today is centralized. Is centralized, so you cannot use the uh, uh, police that's centralized to deal with local issues. Local issues. So when we are able to uh, again, um, that is um, why it's important that, that uh, the, those who are calling for for restructuring of the state, whether it is political, economic restructuring of the Nigerian state, also they are they, they are they are saying the truth because as long as we don't uh, restructure the Nigerian state and uh, so that we allow state to also. Uh, be able to, uh, to have their own police, although some people have, uh, have uh, expressed the fear that, uh, that the governors may hijack it. But I believe that uh, if we're able to, uh, to uh, put some safeguards uh, in, in, in the state police, uh, it, will not be, it will not be abused. For instance, if you look at uh, the uh, western part of Nigeria, when uh, the, that region was experiencing uh, 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 attacks of, uh, of uh, the, the Fulani uh, uh they quickly came together and formed a collective Security, security. The name of uh, Amoteko. And since that time, we've seen was significant drop in terms of the attacks of uh, the the hardest in not to, not to work. So that means that that a local solution, a local uh, uh, structure, was able to uh, to respond to the local security threats. Uh, so so that's that's the way to go. So I, what I'm saying is that we need to begin to rethink the security strategies. It should not be too centralized. We rethink it and also begin to see security not only from a from physical security point of view. We need to see security from the point of view of what of human security, economic security, social security, environmental security. As long as we, we reduce security to what physical security, we continue to what the the the, the 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 responses or the the strategies calibrated to deal with them will not be sufficient to be able to deal with the problem because there are there are there are different uh, um, key drivers of security in the country today. You look at uh, the the southeastern part of Nigeria. What the problem there is what you only need, what you need to do is what is political solution. If Namdi Kanu today is released today, I'm sure that what that the residents in the southeast what will be significantly dealt with. And again, as as I said earlier on, if the question of unemployment today you have what you have a uh, more than 60% um, of Nigerians, uh, the Nigerian population, the, which is about 217 million, 60% uh, of it are, are youth. And uh, you and I know that uh, that significant number, percentage of these youth are, what, are unemployed, if, including those who are what, who have even gone to university grad, they're not unemployed. And they are the ones that, uh, that uh, are perpetrating some of these uh, secret threats we are seeing today. So today, uh, the youth, significant number of should have become cannon fodders, cannon fodders for violence used by or by selfish politicians. So we need to begin to rethink the strategy, our strategy of, of dealing with security. If we think that, that uh, the military alone can, what military approach alone uh, can deal with uh, the kind of insecurity we are facing in the country, then we'll be missing the point. Hmm. We All right. We need to, uh, to sit down, get to understand what are the key drivers of insecurity. Whether in the northeast, in the northwest, in north central, and begin to work to use the instrumentality of governance to address these things. 
this, address these root causes. Mm. Only you... when that is done, that will be able to what, to see significant reduction in terms of the insecurity we are seeing today. Otherwise, they will continue to, what, to reinvent themselves, as we have seen today. From Boko Haram, we now have a banditry. You know? So tomorrow, we now have a, the upper insurgency. Tomorrow, it could be somewhere else. Mm. Prof, uh, you have uh, consistently advocated good governance and inclusivity uh, in dealing with the issue of uh, insecurity. But there, are, there is a school of thought that thinks that uh, good governance and inclusiveness alone uh, may not be the solution to our problems as a people and as a nation. Well, well I, I, I disagree with them. Uh, let, let's let's uh, look at the Southeast, for instance. What is the, the fuel, you understand, that is uh, uh, the, the, the agitation in the Southeast? It's the, basically what political exclusion. So if you deal with the question of political exclusion in the Southeast today, then the hyper insurgency what will fizzle out. Go to the Northwest not, not, uh, also. The, the questions of what the, the bandits today, those who are bandits today were people who were others. They are cattle were were were, were, were rustled. Yes, so they also have grievance also. So grievance also. And uh, they also tell you that, that uh, some of these state governors are what have uh, taken over what the lands that what that uh, they are supposed to use what to graze their animals also. They have been taken the land grab through land land grab. So you see that these are questions of what of uh, of uh, uh, governance. You understand? Know, how do you govern govern what land? You understand? Know, how do you govern what uh, inclusivity is? What is key? Is key to what to addressing the Nigerian problem today. Last uh, administration, uh, one of the major problem or fuel that was that was causing insecurity in the last administration is uh, mismanagement of diversity. We saw the last administration mismanaging diversity and that fueled insecurity. So, point being made is that what if you like you recruit one million soldiers, we continue to have what insecurity at the states that we are having them today, unless we deal with what the issue of what of governance. In societies where the issues of governance have been dealt with, you see that what that what, although crime is what is a global thing, you see that what, that crime there's a reduction in crime, a reduction in agitation. If you ask every Nigerian, whether it's Ibo or Yoruba, everybody's what is agitated. Everybody has what one agitation, one problem or the other that they think that that the Nigerian state is what is not uh, effectively uh, addressing. So mm. again, it goes back to the issues of what of governance. When I talk about governance, I'm not only talking about what economic governance. I'm also talking about how do you also govern security, the security sector, governing of the security sector. Somebody talked about uh, ethnicity and religion uh, as what as a, a problem today in terms of appointment of what of uh, the service chiefs, and also in terms of what uh, somebody if uh, somebody uh, for instance from the north and there's a problem in the north, the person will what will be food dragging. Instead of the person to deal with, because there, there is people, he should not, he would not be seen as uh, somebody who is what who is uh, killing his people. So we need to govern what be able to what to govern what, and also govern what govern the security sector. Also, the political governance also is also very, very important. Mm. The economic governance is also very 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 important. And as I said, <clears throat> questions of governance today. Okay. We are practicing. We claim to want to be uh, a fed, practicing uh, federal system of government, but everything is centralized today. The, on the exclusive list, you have about 68 items controlled by the federal government. So, can we use the instrument of governance and restructuring to what to be able to what, to bring, remove some of those uh, those issues on what on the exclusive and bring them down to the state so our state can also what, be buoyant to be able to what, to respond to what to the challenges within the state also. Okay. So today, okay, bro. Prof, uh, let, let me come in here and ask uh, uh, Mr. James uh, to weigh in on this matter, whether he thinks that uh, provision of good governance and inclusivity would, for instance, uh, make terrorism, which has become, uh, which has lived with us for over a decade, simply go away. Well, it, it may not go away completely, but it may be reduced because some people are born hard to be involved in crime, crime as a profession. Now, governance is a thing that is supposed to be the basket where all of us are supposed to be happy <coughs> that things are working well for everybody. So when you see these things are there for you and for every other person to enjoy, and then people still are not uh, agitating for maybe lack of what a fee is supposed to be for them and it's not there, you can't hardly define it. So good governance is good. Inclusivity is very good, but apart from these things, 
how much of education did our people have in terms of understanding that an Igbo man is my brother when he comes into my place? Now, it is not just about giving appointments to those who are supposed to just be there because of ethnicity. Now, it is because we want services to be given to every other person. So it is the effectiveness of those who put in place for them to provide services for everybody that will make people feel that the government is working well. But when you even give appointments to each and every tribe in Nigeria, because you want to do inclusiveness, you give to about all the races in Nigeria, all the age groups in Nigeria, you will still discover that you can't get a good governance on them because everybody is coming with his mindset. So the first thing is, those that were given this appointment are giving them the responsibility to manage government. Do they look at you as someone that needs services? The thing is, we are selfish, we are corrupt, we just want to make sure that we have an opportunity. So once you put infrastructure in place to ensure that you have good roads, you have good lighting system in towns, you have good water, you know, this quite a lot of people will just virtually go away. So uh, good governance will really reduce insecurity in the country. Now, within the military also, you are supposed to have commanders that are nationalistic in their ideas and thoughts. Now, when the, this government came in, before they could come in, there was that reduction. Now they came, appointments are met. You have never had a policy trust of the military on what they intend doing. Now, you have this closer loss of the armed men that you have today. Military has been provided with virtually everything they needed. But when you look at the system today, does government really take a look at the modern warfare fighting packages that other countries are embracing? Why can't we look at what is happening in Russia and Ukraine, where guns are not really very effective as drones? That how much is a drone? So when we have drones today, and the army agrees that we can deploy drones to get this intelligence and uh, even fire from the air using the same drones, it's going to do a lot of things for us to ensure that the military too has agreed to ensure that good governance within them, as an institution within Nigeria, has improved. And the quality of service delivery to the citizenry has improved. The quality of weapons they have has improved. But you need people who have that conscience to understand that they must think very well and very fast and ensure that to complement the policies of government in each of our own departments, we must be able to sit up and ensure that we also bring up policies that can argument what central government is planning for the majority of all of us. But where these things are not done, and you have an IG or police, you have a chief army staff or a NAVA staff that they say pro procure arms. And then you go to number buy recycle dams and come back, paint them and say, okay, this is what we have. You are still going to have that bad governance at the detriment of what the federal government intends to do. When laws are made, it is the enforcement that makes even the good governance also to sustain. Where laws are made against corruption and corruption is still thriving, laws are made against uh, not going to school and people still don't want to go to school. Laws are made to ensure that the university has the best quality education and VCs are not going to sit down to ensure that research work is being doing. Now, government will be frustrated because the apparatus of government that's supposed to do these things are not being able to do it. So, to not cover up these lapses, you will see them falling back to these uh, non-state uh, actors to empower them, to ensure that they cause mayhem and destabilize government. So, at times, insecurity is not just because government is not doing well. But certain individuals feel that if they are not able to not destabilize government at particular levels of it, they are going to be caught. And in order for them not to be caught, they must create confusion within government. So, mm -hmm. You will keep having the insecurity even if government provides everything for us because insecurity is a thing that is universal. It did not start today, it's not going to end tomorrow. So even if you do whatever thing, you can still have the insecurity even in our own houses. But the fact is that good governance can reduce it to the very minimum. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Ambanefo, uh, uh, Mr. James has just raised a very valid point, uh, a, a key point uh, about the deployment of ground troops to almost to, to, to solving almost every security issue uh, as has been the case in Niger state for instance where we just lost a couple I mean a number of scores of soldiers uh, who ought to be alive when we could have deployed drones to do just the same work now do you think that the current administration is taking the proper steps and I'd like you to take that alongside the appointment of ministers designate for these three key ministries defense interior police affairs and whether or not the in in, uh, in deploying these people to these areas they, they exactly know what 
is required in tackling the issues of insecurity, of terrorism, of banditry, of criminality? Okay. <clears throat> I take lead from what he has presented so far. And if I understand uh, the questions properly, uh, you want to know whether the president has taken a, a step in the right direction, especially with regards to the appointments of the Minister of Interior, the Minister of Defense, and so on and so forth. And also in deploying foot soldiers in areas where ambush has occurred. The most important thing which is fundamental is one, for one to emancipate from mental slavery and inculcate in himself individual qualities of self-awareness, a patriotic nature for the sovereign state of Nigeria, bearing in mind that if those ground troops are deployed, for instance, to Niger State, where the latest incident occurred, question, will the people of Niger State appreciate that they are, there's, it's not an attack on Niger State people? without unnecessary vituperations. Oh, they have come to kill us. Oh, because we are, we, Nigeria has turned themselves into complainants. Niger State is not the first place where in, uh, uh, ambush occurred. So it has occurred in so many places, in the southeast, in the north central, in the northeast, and so on and so forth. The major problem, whether you use drone and identify the spot and begin to bombard, the question is, Will the people of Niger accept that the people that are bombed are those criminals that are causing security, insecurity in their state? Take Southeast, for instance. Most of the billionaires, most of the big men cannot go to their town again. They want to go and have largest in their country homes, but they can't go there any longer. Would you think that if they invite the army to come and do ordinary show of force, the people of the South, it will not rise and say they are marginalizing them. It is an internal diplomacy that is required in this instance. We have to be firm. We have to emancipate from mental slavery. We have to inculcate in ourselves individual qualities of self-awareness, realizing cohesion and oneness. It doesn't matter whose horse is God, so that we can face the security challenges accordingly. I remember Governor Autumn shouting, wailing all the time, how they are killing his people. Of course, what he was saying was jamming. But the thing is that the political will of tackling these issues is the problem. For instance, in the issue of uh, appointment of, um, is it the national security, the, the chief of, uh, sorry, the defense minister. Everyone is appointed according to his capacity. I remember the good book which is the scripture. Paul was once a murderer, but for reasons best known to God, he chose him for people like him. And he was able to win souls. So whether anybody says they are capable or they are not capable is immaterial. What is important is they have been appointed. Let them come into the field and let's see what they have to do. Mm. Now, the, the reason I ask that question, see James, is, is the fact that, uh, that given the very delicate nature of um, security that the president or, ought to have uh, maybe chosen and deployed persons with um, military and security background for these offices and that they probably may uh, understand the situation better than uh, uh, civilians who may not have a, be a good understanding of the situation but again there are those who have argued that in the past we brought in people as ministers who had military background, security background, yet it didn't appear to be very effective. Yes, uh, I was going to say that because appointments of this nature are dynamic but uh, very important. If you look at the previous ministers of defense from Obasanjo to the last government, they've been ex-servicemen. And uh, we still have an increase in the tempo of insecurity that is still on today. Now, in the ministry itself, like Minister of Defense, a minister is there as a head, yes, but they have directorates, and each directorate is headed by a major general or a general. Now, they are the people that are the technical support team of the minister. So decision-making at that level is not taken by the minister alone. It should be a holistic thing. 
except a minister who really don't know what he wants to offer for Nigeria. He can sit in the office and give instructions that may further dampen the morale of the military on ground. So anybody who appoints as a minister who has been a former governor, who has been a former senator, I think he can do well. But where I find fault is for you to put two ex-governors in one ministry, one for minister and another one for the state. Now, if you had not done that, it would have been better to put a retired service officer who would have been a deputy minister of defense state so that he can complement the loopholes or whatever the senior minister could have. But by and large, it's always good that you also make consultation because if you're a minister, it doesn't mean you are an expert in that field because most of them are appointed to head ministries now and not technocrats in those fields. So defense can be an exception, though very crucial as it is, but because the ministry itself has directories that are headed by those who can advise the minister on policy issues that are supposed to be taken, that will be for the best interest of the service. Now, if you look at the police affairs, the minister for police doesn't really do operational issues that is done by the Supreme General Police. So the Minister of Police Affairs is only there for administrative welfare mm. of the service itself to ensure that funds are made available to the service, uh, keys are made available, and then other general policies are also good for the police to so either change or whatever. And then in the police, you have a service commission that is headed by Inspector General of Police retired, who can also complement the thinking cap of these three arrowheads, the minister, the Inspector General of Police, and then him as the chairman of the Police Service Commission. So the police, there's no issue with that one. Okay. But when you come to internal affairs, minister, now you have about four services that are embedded in that ministry. You have immigration, you have prison, you have fire service, and I think even the uh, uh, prisons are there. And these are headed correctional by... Services, yes, correctional services, they call services now. Mm. Now, these are headed by seasoned people who rose from the ranks to these levels. Now, they are professionals in their field. They can also give the same support measures to the minister for him to work well. Okay. The Nigerian factor has always been the minister fighting those that he meets on ground, and I don't want it to hurt. So he may not bring in the issue of nepotism. As soon as we're able to get rid of these things, that proficiency should be the realistic. Seniority should be there for you to choose. It is going to give confidence in those who are coming from behind to not get to the ladder. Okay. Uh, but Professor Mamadou, uh, you, you are going to have the last say here we are, because our, our time is fast spent. I just need you in 60 seconds uh, to have your thoughts on uh, these having round pegs, uh, round pegs in round holes. Uh, do, do you think that these people uh, have the psychology and uh, also understand the language of uh, the security architecture in Nigeria today? No, no, I don't think. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, and I think uh, that's a, a very big oversight on the part of uh, the president. Um, considering the, um, the avalanche of security threats we are facing in the country, to the, uh, some of us uh, believe that what you would have uh, um, ensure that, that you get the right persons that have the experience, the capacity to be able to uh, to do the job. Um, although it's a political appointment, but uh, uh, you cannot give what you don't have. So so uh, what it means that, uh, that um, the president, president may need to, uh, to maybe also get uh, advisors, get experts uh, to advise him. Um, yes, some have argued that um, even when we had uh, military generals uh, uh, appointed as the defense defense chief, uh, what did they do? Uh, again, what 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 was the capacity of what of the 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 former general appointed, the former uh, defense uh, uh, minister? What was his capacity? Choose the right person. Um, if you look at um, the police service commission today, where you have uh, Dr. Arashi, uh, he's a very competent hand. Uh, some of us are, uh, were thinking that what maybe we would have employed somebody like uh, Dan Bazao or somebody, a very competent uh, person to be able to uh, be able to, uh, to uh, bring his experience to be and be able to effectively coordinate the ministry so that they'll be able to, uh, to deliver uh, quality service. But the kind of people we have today, uh, they are former governor. So what do you expect from them? Mm. Uh, even when they were in their state, uh, in their state, they were experiencing banditry. What did they do? Banditry is what is, uh, is still uh, ongoing in their state. So... Uh, I don't see them. Um, I don't see them coming up with uh, with uh, initiatives and ideas that will help to really solve the problem. So the president needs to rely maybe on the NSA to be able to uh, 
do what they are supposed to do. This, this, All right. This, this, all right, uh, Professor Jude uh, Momodu, thank you so much. I'm sorry our time is up. We must go. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Professor Jude Momodu, Director of mm -hmm. Center for Peace and Security Studies at the Modibo Adama University in Yola, uh, uh, in Northeast Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, he was joined <laughs> right here in the studio by Mr. Michael Mbanefo, is a security analyst and a lawyer. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. You Benefo. Much. And Thank of course, Vanifa uh, Tesu James, a retired senior police officer, uh, is also with us here. Thank you so much. It's Thank my you. pleasure. And to our viewers out there, we want to thank you for investing your time with us. Please join us again when we bring you a fresh edition of the program, People, Politics and Power. Bye for now.